Welcome. I wanted to uh, start with a very uh, short uh, uh, overview of um, sorry uh, of the um, of the webinar. Webinar. I'm going to be uh, introducing um, the the topic, telling you a little bit about this uh, science of learning uh, collaborative network. Um, how it's been designed, that why I refer to this as a trading zone, um, why we're focusing on uh, spatial thinking. Um, and we've, um, in order to go from the abstract to the concrete, we've selected two specific spatial thinking challenges, things uh, where we've found that students have difficulty in the classroom. Um, and we also know something about the cognitive science of the uh, of the challenge uh, and then Nicole and Mike will be um, speaking about the challenges and how we have been working as a network to design something that could be used in the classroom to uh, directly address the uh, challenges. So the, um, the term trading zone comes from uh, the history of science. It was uh, de originally developed to refer to um, work that was done during World War II on developing radar where uh, engineers and theoretical physicists were literally put in, into the same room to work on a common problem. Um, and uh, the, the success of, the, of that approach um, has been identified by uh, historians to lie partly in um, presenting theorists with a concrete problem uh, which allowed them to test how well specified the theory was. And so the analogy here is we are, at, we are taking cognitive science theories and we're testing to see how well specified they are to see if they can tell us precisely what needs to be done uh, in a classroom when a student is struggling. So the, um, the, the blue arrows in the center of this image are uh, intended to represent um, the interactions that occur within a trading zone. So there is me on the left, um, the cognitive scientist who is trying to take something that we know about the brain and apply it to learning and geology. Uh, and then there is, um, um, Mike and Nicole on the right, um, who are presenting, um, who, who are taking what they know about geology and um, bringing it back to tell us something about uh, how the mind works. The network has been designed so that um, we are working closely together. The images on the right are the um, people in the network. Uh, so. Uh, that's me, the leftmost image. Um, I, I'm out of line because I realized this morning there isn't a picture of me and that you might want to associate a picture with the voice you're hearing. Uh, and then next to me is Doug at the top, uh, Doug Lombardi, who's an education researcher, uh, Alex Dvatsis, who's an early earth sedimentologist, uh, and Nicole. Uh, Nicole, would you want to say hello to so people recognize your voice. Hello, everyone. And then below that is Mike. Hi, everybody. Uh, and then Basil Tickoff uh, and uh, Steve Whitmire, who are structural geologists, Kim Castens, who was an oceanographer and now an education researcher, and Carol Ormond, who is all, as may be familiar to many of you who works with CERC. The images at the bottom are uh, intended to highlight the nature of learning as we conceive of it, which is not something that just happens in undergraduates. It, it occurs uh, across the lifetime, lifespan. And what we want to understand is how to support learning um, throughout the lifespan. The network has been constructed to focus on learning um, in the high school, in the transition um, between high school uh, through un undergraduate training. So it includes both introductory STEM courses as well as advanced STEM courses. And the, the examples that we're gonna be talking about today come from uh, that where we do other work um, that you won't be hearing about in the high schools. So um, one, um, 
One goal of this webinar, as I understand, is to provide some guidance on how to um, develop, uh, how, how for the how for you as the attendees to develop your own um, research programs uh, in uh, in uh, geoscience education, and so. Um, what I'm going to present here is um, it is my best argument for a pitch to a cognitive scientist. What that is, what what is going to, what what can you bring to them and say, uh, I I got this idea. I would like some help, uh, and I'd like to have you join a group um, uh, on geoscience education. So the, the obvious request is to use something that we know about cognitive science to apply to geoscience education. And that's familiar outreach to the cognitive scientists. So they might well do that um, because they're good community uh, members and that uh, using one's expertise um, for the broader academy is being helpful. Um, for me, the, the, the really big value here however, was, um, was this. Um, I think I'm doing some of the best science um, that I have done in my uh, career. And I think that it is transformative in the true sense of really shaking up um, a, a number of uh, theories within cognitive science. And so um, I, would, I was gonna tell you very briefly about two insights that, um, that cognitive science has gained from geoscience. And so I think the pitch is um, not just to your colleagues, not just to be helpful to you um, as standard outreach, but there's an opportunity for them too. So um, one, uh, one thing we learned uh, comes from an experience that is probably familiar to all geologists who have taken students on field trips, which is you walk up to an outcrop like that and students think, Whatever, the, whatever they see at the surface, whatever feature there, that fault projects straight back. And that it makes the instructors nuts because um, they know it's going to happen. They know it's not right. Um, and it, it, it turns out that this um, probably involves a, a relatively low level visual mechanism that nobody in the uh, perception field had ever realized exists. And so that there is a there is a cognitive science explanation for why students are so inclined to make this error, and this is something that we never would have known about without going out uh, into the field with the geologists uh, and recognizing, oh, this is not something. This is not quirky. This is something that almost everybody is experiencing, which suggests that it's something that is likely fundamental to the way we think about the world. The, um, the, the other uh, experiment uh, comes from uh, the uh, structural geologists um, pointing out to me gently um, that although I, as a cognitive scientist, knew a lot about mental rotation, I didn't know anything about um, mental non-rigid transformations. Uh, and um, what we did a few years ago was we developed an experiment where we asked, well, is simulating non-rigid events the same as simulating rigid events? And the answer is no. Um, what we did is we created a a um, we created stimuli which simulated faults, but faults not in rocks, faults in words. Um, and we would fault these words and uh, ask geologists what was what did the word used to look like. So they need to um, reverse the sequence of faults. It turns out geologists are really good at this game, um, much better than chemists. Uh, and um, However, geologists and chemists were e equivalent on uh, a standard measure of mental rotation. So um, what that was telling us is that there was a previously unrecognized mental ability to simulate non-rigid uh, events. And so um, both of these were very important cognitive science insights and they wouldn't have been, that wouldn't have uh, been possible without um, uh, working closely with geologists. Uh, 
So um, th this slide represents the way we think about um, learning in the context of a, a spatial discipline. Uh, if you start all the way on the right, this, the, the students have some mental model of the world, their internal representation of the world. This is a model that they can use to sim simulate the world. Oh, this, is a, this is their understanding of the world. Um, if you use that model, if the student uses that model to make a prediction and puts that prediction down, commits that prediction to paper, then they can compare that prediction to what actually happens in the world. And if that prediction is spatial in nature, the comparison between their prediction and what actually happens in the world will yield a spatial error signal. And they can use that spatial error signal to correct their internal representation. So um, th this idea of prediction, comparison, spatial feedback is the, is the heart of the, uh, of the research enterprise. Uh, it, it has the value that this is something that students students can get feedback without the instructor being involved. The instructor only needs to provide the, the, the correct answer uh, and, and request that the student makes a prediction. The student, everything else the student does by itself. So it's something that can scale relatively well. Uh, we have uh, used this model to help students develop a um, better understanding of block diagrams. And the way we did that was we would show them uh, clay that's about to get cut. Uh, we asked them to make a prediction in the form of a sketch. And then we show them the correct answer and they can compare their, um, their sketch to the correct answer. Uh, and when they do this a number of times, their, um, their reasoning about block diagrams, their understanding of block diagrams of three dimensional, of their representation of the three dimensional space inside block diagram uh, improves by about one standard deviation. Uh, of the measure that we're using. Uh, so the way we work is, um, the first question we ask is, what sort of topics do students consistently find are hard to learn? Uh, so um, in, in trying to think about whether there's something about uh, everyday spatial reasoning that's getting in the way, uh, if once we identify the thing that we want to be working on, we ask how best to get the student's mental model to be made public so it can be compared to a right answer and that they can try and provide some feedback for themselves. I want to pause at this point uh, uh, to invite all of the participants to submit um, spatial challenges that they've observed in the classroom. One of the uh, aims of this uh, research is to is to collect spatial reasoning challenges and prioritize our work. That is to work on the ones that um, that are that are most important, that are central to understanding a topic, that are widespread, and thus having some uh, some tool that educators could use would be particularly helpful. So, if you have an observation, if you have a thought about something that really makes you nuts as an instructor, something predictable that happens, um, uh, could you put a description of that in and uh, preface your comment with the title hard topic so we can sort that from the other sorts of questions? Uh, and at this point, I'm going to uh, hand things over to Nicole. Okay, so our first example problem uh, deals with frames of reference. So uh, when you're looking at this slide, uh, you may notice a person in a red shirt who is on the train car, a person in the yellow shirt who's standing on the ground, and they're talking about the differences in their frame of reference uh, with regard to motion. But uh, what if I said that the red person was under the word reference and the person in the yellow shirt was under the word examples? Uh, this is true, but it's not you, not necessarily the frame of reference that you were originally drawn to when you see this image. The green box frames uh, frames that conversation, so that's where your eye goes. Um, so the point here is that students encounter frame of reference problems in our classes, and because we have expertise, 
we may be blind to what those challenges are. So uh, in some cases, students may not even realize there is another frame of reference to, to consider. Uh, next slide. So an example of this is uh, plate motion. And we can talk about plate motion. Uh, this is a bit of a noisy graphic, but uh, you have relative plate velocities, so how one plate is moving relative to another, and then you have absolute plate ve velocities where we look at plate motion relative to a fixed point in the mantle. And um, this may be a fairly challenging concept for students, so we could simplify it by just talking about uh, one of these things. Uh, next slide. So let's look at this map. So you have a, a hot spot and it has, and a, if a student were to look at this image, they may think that the hot spot has moved uh, along those red lines. And what we really want the students to get out of it is that the plate is moving relative to a stationary point. Next slide. So how can we access the student's understanding of this? So in my class, I use student response systems. So uh, they used to be called clickers and you have uh, these devices and the students do a multiple choice response using this handheld device. And now uh, there are smart technologies and uh, many companies that run uh, interfaces off the web that students can use with their smartphone. So uh, if you've heard of uh, reef polling or turning technology. Uh, there's a few different technologies out there and even some course management systems have this capability. So Blackboard has this option where students can participate in uh, questions using their smartphones. Um, in my class I use Top Hat and uh, usually I just use multiple choice questions sprinkled throughout the lecture to highlight the most important concepts and to get a sense of where their understanding is. Um, but some of these clicker systems have the option of a click on diagram question. So uh, this is an example of a question that we developed where they are, the response is recorded by them clicking on the diagram. So the question asks, X is a currently active hotspot and the tectonic plate has moved southwest over this hotspot. If the plate started moving north, click where you would expect the next caldera to form. So take a second and um, mentally log your answer that you would put for this question. Next slide. So Top Hat uh, produces uh, heat maps that give you a sense of where the students clicked and they light up based on the concentration of clicks. So on the left hand side you'll see a pre-instruction heat map of where students clicked before I started teaching the, in the beginning of the course, before I taught the content. And then on the right side, you'll see the responses students made after I had taught the content. Um, and it was actually also after they had watched the Iris video on hotspot formation, where there's an animation showing how hotspots form as the plate moves over the hotspot. So, uh, so that could be a little depressing if you're an instructor because clearly they didn't all get it. Um, but as a cognitive scientist, you might be really excited here because you're seeing that there is a, the wrong answers are converging on, on a particular spot. So this tells us that there's some sticky um, error in frame of reference for this particular problem. Next slide. So uh, clickers in general can be a good way to identify these common errors. If you have the opportunity to use these click on diagram type questions, they provide really quick feedback uh, for you to assess where students are at. So when I did this as my post assessment question and I saw that there was still this big divergence, uh, then I engaged in, a, in, a, in pedagogy to try to get the students to have that, that understanding. So I had them hold the piece of paper horizontally with their pencil underneath as if it were the hot spot burning through the plate and move the piece of paper uh, along that south uh, to the southwest uh, so they could see how it would make a trend of calderas to form the current one. And then they had to move that plate north so they could see that the uh, correct next spot would be south of the X. 
So using gesture is a good way to have students make this leap. And of course, it also made me feel better because I got students to say things like, oh, I get it now. They totally had that, uh, that moment. Um, OK, so click next slide. So if you don't have these hotspot uh, type questions available, um, we're going to be developing uh, multiple choice questions so that uh, the distractor options are the most common errors that we see. And that should help to diagnose these spatial errors in the middle during class. Next slide. So if you're, uh, if you're following along and you have any uh, comments you want to add or questions or if there's specific hard topics that have come up, please post it in the chat box. And I'll turn it over to Mike to talk about the next problem. Next. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so the, the topic that I'm going to be talking about is uh, the elastic rebound theory. So uh, I'm primarily a seismologist, and when uh, confronted with the question of what are, what are some, some of the more hard topics uh, in my discipline, uh, this is one that came up. Now, I, I, it may seem a bit sort of uh, different than your expectation, uh, because uh, we, we can often teach students at the intro level um, to, to say that earthquakes are caused by the elastic rebound theory. <laughs> my, my concern over this is, is how, how deep is that knowledge? How, how much do they understand what is happening in the elastic rebound theory? Uh, in part, you know, one of the reasons I identify it is, is because of its importance. That for me, you know, the elastic rebound theory is really at the heart of connecting many sort of key concepts uh, in tectonics and seismology, you know, understanding how uh, faults behave and how that leads to earthquakes, uh, I think is really critical. And so I, I wanted to spend some time uh, looking at this and, and how deeply students understand it uh, and, and thinking about ways to try and improve that understanding. So we came up with a couple of uh, questions to ask students um, uh, to work on. And, and so uh, we have done both some sketching uh, and some multiple choice versions of this. We started with the sketching to get some ideas like Nicole had described about what our primary distractor should be. But uh, I'll show you some of the sketch results here initially. And so um, what, we're, what we asked them to do in, in this case where we have a map view showing a fault uh, and a pair of fences, we asked them to draw uh, the, what the fences would look like 100 years after they were built, but before a large earthquake. We then asked them uh, what would the fence look like then immediately after the large earthquake. Uh, and then uh, asked them a, a third question about uh, what do these fences then look like 100 years after that large earthquake. So let's take a, a look at some of the results. Next slide. Okay, so uh, I've, I've uh, shown a couple of student examples here. The, the top row are, are correct answers, so uh, students answering these questions correctly. So I'm going to go through those just to make sure we're all on the same page in terms of what, what should be expected. Uh, and so that first one uh, on the left is the pre-earthquake case where we should see a fence uh, that is bent. Uh, and again, you can get some variation in this answer depending on what students choose as a frame of reference. But in general, they choose the fault as the frame of reference. So they'll show the fault on the fences on either side uh, being bent uh, strongly uh, near the fault and then uh, relatively straight as you get further away uh, from the fault. And so that, that is a correct answer that, that we see um, most of the bending occurring near the fault, but uh, decreased at, at distance. All right, and then during the earthquake, uh, sorry, immediately after the earthquake, uh, the fences uh, should look uh, like the, the middle um, diagram where they are straight uh, on either side, but there is now an offset uh, that is basically the portion of the rock near the fault has caught up uh, with the rest uh, of the rock on either side of the fault. And then the last one is the post-earthquake, uh, 100 years after the earthquake, uh, that there should still be a, an offset uh, that is similar to what was seen immediately after the earthquake. But now uh, bending has also occurred, and that bending should look like it did originally, just that there's now an offset uh, between the two sides. So these are the answers that we were uh, looking for, anticipating getting. And we got in some cases, uh, but it highlighted uh, a number of misconceptions, uh, wrong answers that students chose. Uh, when doing this, and so I've, I've highlighted some of that along the bottom. So, uh, you know, what may seem a little bit surprising, but uh, we, we found a number of students who, who would actually just draw fences in the exact same spot uh, 100 years after the fence was built, that basically 
there was, you know, an envision it, we are interpreting that says those folks are seeing that uh, all of the rock uh, near the fault is, is locked uh, and, and stationary uh, prior to the earthquake and that in essence, they're not seeing the rocks bend. And so we think that's a, a primary sort of misconception we have to deal with. It relates to what Tim was describing earlier about these sort of uh, non having difficulty understanding not rigid um, transformations, or in this case, deformation, that, uh, that students have trouble thinking of rocks as things that bend. They, they see them in nature as things that, that are uh, hard and rigid, and so and envisioning them as bending uh, is very difficult uh, for them to do. And so um, what's funny about that is then in the, the second uh, answer, you know, what, what does the uh, fault look like immediately after? Even though they showed no bending in the first slide, they then see they then show uh, rapid uh, offset uh, of the of the fence uh, during the earthquake, such that they can get the correct answer for the second question, but uh, not having seen what led to it, they just see this uh, uh, remarkable offset on both sides. Now, and, and then what you would see again for students who who didn't show any bending earlier is that when you ask them the third question about what does it look like 100 years after the earthquake? It looks no different than immediately after the earthquake. That, that in essence, no, no bending has been generated. Uh, uh, everything is, is locked in place. Uh, so again, it's another symptom of the, the rocks not, not bending uh, being a, uh, an issue for them. All right, let's, let's move to the next slide. All right, so I, I, I also wanted to, to examine you know, how students uh, think about elastic rebound, uh, in, in particular in using some of the primary data we could we could give them today that would show elastic rebound actually happening, uh, not just as a theory, but but observations of it of it occurring, and that would come in the form of geodetic data and in particular on uh, GPS data. So um, I, I do try to introduce GPS data as early as I can um, to students. Uh, it is because it's such a primary observation of plate tectonics. I, I think it's important for them to understand it, uh, and so. It gives me an opportunity then to see, you know, how well do they understand um, GPS vectors, but then also how well do they understand elastic rebound theory um, using um, GPS uh, motions. And so, uh, for for this set of questions, we then again ask them to to sketch, uh, but instead of a fence this time, we're asking the, to draw the motion vectors uh, for these GPS stations. Uh, and then uh, after we had done some sketching uh, activity, we could we could then develop some multiple choice questions. So we have. Uh, collected some of that data as well, but in this case, um, we asked them a uh, sort of a before, immediately after, and then and then later on, uh, similar to the to the first set. Um, and so, uh, I we gave them uh, two cases, right? So there's a set of questions that are designed around case one, uh, which is you know giving them an initial vector that's off to the far left uh, of the diagram, and then we also gave them a case where the the vector is right near the fault. Um, and so uh, it sort of allows them to, to have some sort of starting point for what are we looking to, for in terms of scale of, of the motion um, and, and direction of motion. So some of that comes from the fault as well, but uh, we, we wanted to start them off at different points. So I'm gonna talk about the case one uh, results first uh, and what they drew for the, the other GPS stations uh, in that case, and then I'll come back to case two. So let's, let's move to the next slide. Okay, so um, for, for case one, um, the, there were some students uh, who, who drew that correctly. Uh, and so what we were looking for um, was a, a gradational change um, in the size of the vector. Um, so uh, what that diagram is showing is that basically some very small um, motions near the fault, if not just uh, empty, that, that basically no motion uh, near the fault. And that's on the other side of the fault, uh, the motion is, as you get far away from the fault, is roughly similar size, uh, but pointing in the opposite direction, right? So that reflects the the orientation of the fault, right? That's the fault is labeled with a, a relative motion, and so that's what we'd be looking for in terms of those those vectors. Uh, but again, most students, uh, basically nearly all students, choose the fault as our reference frame. That that in essence, there's no motion near the fault because the fault is locked, uh, but that the the vectors. Uh, are are gradually larger as you move away from the fault. That that in essence is that observation of um, non non rigid deformation. That there is um, some some bending uh, of the rocks to accommodate that different motion. Um, I should mention just that uh, correct answers were certainly more common uh, at the 
uh, senior level, uh, beginning grad student level, that a course uh, at the sort of uh, senior undergrad, uh, beginning grad student level, we saw more, more answers that look like this uh, at the sort of um, 200 uh, level, the sort of sophomore, uh, sometimes junior, uh, in, that, in those classes, uh, pretty rare to see folks sketch this answer. And then at the intro level, when given multiple choice, uh, again, uh, not very many folks uh, choosing, choosing that answer. Uh, and this, uh, the next, uh, the common misconception here, uh, example at the bottom, that, that is uh, chosen more often, uh, particularly at those lower levels, uh, which is that, that in essence, the, the fault is not locked, that you'd see roughly equal arrows uh, on either side of the fault. I did choose this, this one here where not uncommon to see uh, vectors near the fault um, being uh, uh, a little bit, even a little bit larger than uh, vectors uh, uh, as you move further away from the fault. So, so again, basically the, the primary misconception we're seeing evidence for is that even when being asked about, you know, draw the GPS vectors before the earthquake, they're not recognizing that the fault is locked prior to the earthquake. So again, you know, this is something where I worry that students can recite what the elastic rebound theory is, but not actually understand that, you know, locking of the fault uh, and bending of the rocks is a critical component of getting that to happen. And that, that was borne out in, in, in our collection of data that uh, many students are, are, ha are struggling with the fault being locked and, and sort of how to represent that um, in, in their diagram. Okay, so uh, let's, let's go ahead and move to the, to the next slide. I wanna show uh, a scenario then where, where we move to um, a vector near the fault. Uh, and that would be a case where uh, students uh, are, are being asked to think of things in a different reference frame, right? So um, this is results from that first question, which is again, what, what do the vectors look like prior to the earthquake? And so this should be, you know, th there should be a locked fault at that point uh, and that the vectors should change um, in, in scale as you get away from the fault that would reflect the bending, right? And so because we gave them a vector with considerable size near the fault, you know, we're asking them to change the reference frame from being uh, stationary on the fault, right? We're asking them to create a reference frame now, which would, would place one side of the fault uh, as being stationary. And so in this case, the, the diagram to the right uh, that shows the correct answer, that student chose uh, the right-hand side of the fault as being the sort of um, frame of reference. So if you consider these two plates, for example, that would be the, the frame of reference plate. And so the vectors are gonna be small then as you get further into the interior of the plate, but then as you move towards the fault, the vectors are larger because um, that rock is being bent um, by, by motion on, uh, from the, the uh, plate on the other side, right? And so the, the two vectors are roughly the same on either side. And then as you go to the left-hand side, those vectors get larger. Again, a reflection of the gradual change there, the bending of the rocks um, that account for the overall plate motion between the right side and, and the left side. So uh, this was certainly a more difficult question for students when we were asking them, to not only sort of think about the elastic rebound theory in terms of having a locked fault uh, and, and gradational motion that reflects rock bending, uh, they, they really struggled with combining uh, those things with a, a different reference frame. Uh, and so uh, what we found is uh, uh, even, even less students when given this, so, so given this question, we, we actually provided some education after case one. So after giving them the case one that was on the prior slide, we would go through a couple of uh, wrong answers um, to sort of ask them, you know, how similar is this to what you wrote? Uh, here's the scientist's reasoning on why this is a wrong answer, and then also showing a correct answer and, and giving the scientific reasoning on, on why that's correct. So even after focusing on that rocks need to bend uh, and that uh, there is the fault needs to be locked, we were still finding if you ask them then a question that forces them to think about a different reference frame, they still made more errors in terms of the fault locking than they did prior to that education, right? That, that causing, th having them think about reference frame created, you know, a disconnect uh, that sort of broke uh, some of their understanding of, of what should be happening in terms of a locked fault. So this, this to me was a really important realization that, that reference frames are such a stumbling block for students that it, that it causes them to get a questions wrong that they, they should be sort of improving at. Um, so again, th this diagram that's on the lower right here what I'm getting at there is, is this is a question now, what does it look like prior to, to an earthquake uh, occurring? And they're showing that offset motion on either side of the fault 
uh, that, that is the kind of motion you should see during uh, the earthquake as opposed to those years prior to an earthquake. That, uh, you know, we think it, it's in part because we gave them an arrow of motion uh, near the fault that they, you know, just couldn't break the idea uh, that that could have some frame of reference to it, but that um, it must mean that the fault is moving. And so if the fault is moving, then the other side of the fault uh, must be moving uh, to the lower right and, and instead of to the upper left. So again, this is a, for us an important realization about how important it is to work on reference frame, not just on understanding elastic rebound. All right, so let's go ahead and, and move to the next slide. All right, so in terms of the pedagogy, I, I think I'm still at an early stage on, on this that, you know, part of it was trying to unpack, you know, what, what are the things that students are struggling with um, and, and therefore uh, give me an opportunity to think about ways to try and improve our teaching strategies. So one of the things that we have focused on already is working through some of the wrong and right answers that, that basically asking students uh, after they've done a couple of, of sketches or multiple choice questions, um, having them reflect on a couple of the answer, potential answer choices. So uh, we've been asking them to think about some wrong answers first and think about how does that compare to what they drew or chose, uh, and, then, and then giving them some scientific reasoning uh, on, on why that answer would be wrong. Um, and so, you know, having them think about, you know, how, how would that differ from, from their reasoning um, in terms of whether or not that was a correct or, or wrong answer. So we'll do that for a couple of wrong answers, and then we'll do that for a right answer. Again, trying to, um, to solidify some of the, uh, the reasoning on, on why um, they should be, uh, what, what are the reasons that lead to the spatial patterns that, that they're observing. So, um, you know, again, I, I think we're, we're focusing then on trying to redo questions that then have slightly different either initial data, uh, different fault orientation, or different reference frame. And so this last one, I, the reference frame that I highlighted, uh, that seems to really uh, be a, a stumbling block for students in terms of if, if you start to ask them about changing and changes in reference frame, uh, that the students uh, start to do worse even with some specific instruction uh, about elastic rebound theory. So uh, it highlights for us that, you know, um, you know, perhaps it's better to either just focus on one at a time, uh, but, but Frankly, uh, you know, if you want to be teaching about some of these tectonic concepts, uh, I think, you know, uh, coming up with improved ways to, to educate about reference frame is important. And so I think, you know, again, uh, Tim mentioned this at the beginning, that, that going to the cognitive uh, science literature then to, to see, you know, how, how do folks uh, think about, uh, you know, why, why reference frame is, you know, sort of stuck for some students, you know, what are some of the strategies for combating that and, and getting folks to think about reference frame or think about things from different reference frames. I think that's something that I'm, I'm seeking uh, now ways to try and improve uh, how I educate students about that. Uh, it was something I sort of took for granted that students could, could manipulate uh, better and uh, before. And I think now I, I would provide more specific instruction on, on manipulation of reference frames um, and, and ways to, to not just assume a reference frame. All right, we move to the next slide. Okay, so uh, I'll let uh, other folks um, jump back in here, but uh, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll put in a plug uh, for this too. The, the Get Spatial Learning Network now has uh, a, a webpage dedicated to it, and in particular, uh, a blog uh, where folks uh, from the trading zone are collaborating and uh, cooperating on ideas uh, related to uh, spatial thinking, particularly in the geosciences. Uh, there's already some great stuff uh, up on that blog that uh, would be sort of an add-on relative to what you've seen uh, in this talk. And I'll let other folks jump in if they have other things they'd like to say. I, actually, this is Tim. Uh, I, I was going to uh, put Mike back on the spot for a second. We, we, we are coming in right where we wanted to be, which was about 45 minutes for the uh, for the talking part of this, uh, leaving plenty of time for, uh, for questions. Um, uh, Mike, w uh, you, you told me that one of the things that you found particularly attractive about this opportunity was um, the, the centrality of the, the blog as par part of our, um, the product of our uh, network. Do you want to say anything more about that? That, that is, it, instead of just writing papers, uh, that uh, one of the things we are doing is regularly um, posting blog posts where um, intentionally the blogs are 
co-written by uh, two people from different disciplines. Yeah, I mean, so I, I, you know, I think there was a bit of hesitation <laughs> by many of us when we heard about this being a component of this project. Uh, I think, you know, uh, disciplinary scientists, uh, you know, particularly uh, folks from a slightly older generation, are, are, you know, a bit resistant to sharing uh, thoughts uh, about our science and approaches we're taking in the form of things like blogs that that we're, we're so used to just focusing our efforts on publications um, that that I think there was some initial hesitation about this idea. But I think I, you know, I've I've certainly swung the other way that having participated in it now, I see this as is a really valuable component of a of a project, particularly that has a sort of broader group involved. But but I think one of the key points about it is that, you know, um, uh, cool projects that are funded often take several years to produce any sort of results that have impact on the community that that, you know, perhaps you might see a, a poster or a, or a presentation at a meeting. But in many cases, those are several years into a project because of the data collection aspect of things, um, you know, trying to vet the analysis to make sure um, the results are, are appropriate and interpreted correctly. And so that just creates this lag between when 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 a project is sort of conceived and when folks start to learn about uh, some of the ideas that are coming out of it. And I think a blog is a way to sort of accelerate that sort of interaction with others about uh, what's happening. And so, uh, again, it's not going to have, uh, you know, pristine results. Uh, I mean, that's still what publications uh, are for, that that they are uh, vetted to a much higher degree. But it's still, I think, important to share ideas both within a network of collaborators, but also uh, to the broader community about, you know, what are the things that we're thinking about? Um, what are the sort of directions we're heading? I think that just creates a sort of better community atmosphere uh, in terms of uh, pursuing science, that, that there is an opportunity to at least be cognizant of other things that people are pursuing. And so um, I think that's a, a, a selling point uh, of the project that, that we're working on. Oh, great. Um, so now we're going to jump into the Q&A period. And Mike, while you're on, um, Kim Kasten's had a question about the fault, I think the elastic rebound slide about, did every student draw every arrow parallel to the fault? Uh, I'm thinking uh, back uh, to answers I've seen. And, and for the most part, the answer is yes. I think when you get down to the so I, the, the results I've looked at most recently are from the, the more senior level class. And so I don't recall seeing uh, either perpendicular or oblique uh, arrows very much in, in those cases. Uh, but I think perhaps at the, at the sort of sophomore, junior level, the, the sort of second class uh, in, in sort of tectonic uh, processes that a student might see, um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there were a few vectors there that that were not parallel to the fault. I have to go back and check, but it was not something that was that was common. Um, in many cases, the, the you know, very commonly you would see just vectors in opposite directions, uh, but parallel to the fault. Um, you know, you've got one one side of the fault moving, you know, parallel to the upper left and then uh, parallel into the uh, lower right on the other side. Okay, great. Um, this question is also from Kim, but it's for Nicole. Nicole, when um, you had the students move the paper, the plate over the pencil, which was supposed to represent the, the hot spot, um, moving the paper towards the north, did you actually have them rotate in the room to face towards the real world north, or was north, like quote unquote, towards the front of the room? I did not have them rotate to real world north. I just focused on the um, north in the map. So that would be towards the front of the room if they were holding their paper upright. <laughs> okay, great, great. And th this is Tim. Uh, th this is Tim. Um, my, my hypothesis about what was going on there, because we know that drawing something from the perception literature on frame of reference is the, the inclination, the, the, the mind's inclination is for the small thing to be moving. So if you go, if, well, actually, I got the slide, so I'm going to go back there. So, uh, that didn't go back. Uh, if the green box car were to move, the overwhelming perceptual experience, if the green box car were to move to the left, just about everybody would report seeing the right, the 
the girl with the red dress moving to the right. So the small thing, when there's, uh, the, the large thing tends to be the frame of reference and tends to be stationary. And so the thought is with this, with the hotspot, that the, the, that the error is, what one explanation for the error is that people can't but help think the small thing is the thing that's moving. So when you said think something's moving north, they thought, okay, whatever, that little X is the thing that's moving north. Uh, and what setting up the, the pencil with the paper helped them recognize is, oh, they've got to be thinking about the larger thing is moving. That's interesting. Okay, great. Um, this question is from John Perry, and I think it's for all of you. Do you think that 3D visualization videos would solve many of these stated problems? This is Tim. Um, the, the, the videos by themselves won't solve the, pro won't solve the problems. Um, the uh, the 3D visualizations in general will 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 always have the problem that um, you're presenting something that is in 2D. You can increase the quality of the information, but almost surely something is going to be hiding something else, and so you're going to uh, you, you're going to be faced with with that problem. Uh, animating it can help students see three-dimensional relationships. Um, but um, videos can be very, can be seductive in that when a student is watching them, they have the, they, they, they experience, the experience is one of ease. It doesn't feel difficult to watch the video. And so the consequence is that they interpret that experience as understanding. Um, and they may in fact not be understanding and there's no confrontation with a misunderstanding. And so um, what, what a, a thing to highlight about what we are doing is that part of the learning here is the student is confronted with a record of what they were thinking. Uh, and um, uh, And can see that what they were thinking doesn't match um, the instruct the, the correct answer. They can't, in the absence of that record, they could just say, oh yeah, yeah, that was what I was thinking. The, the, the same problem exists with sophisticated visualizations is that someone may have a sense that they understand and there's no check to make sure that they do. Well, Mike or Nicole, do you have any follow up with that with Tim? Yeah, I'll go next. Uh, so I, I haven't given uh, 3D visualizations uh, of elastic degree mountain to students, but I have given them 2D that um, uh, they've, they've seen uh, some animations, uh, particularly at the intro level. I have them specifically look at them uh, right before engaging in some of these questions. Uh, I asked them to review Iris's um, uh, animation of uh, fault uh, motion that shows elastic rebound. Uh, rows of crops uh, are shown, I think, in that case, that they can see, you know, the, the bending of those rows, um, you know, prior to an earthquake occurring. Uh, and it, uh, uh, you know, uh, not everyone gets the right answer after watching that video. <laughs> uh, so many, many folks uh, struggling with with the fact that rocks bend um, when when going to to choose answers. Um, so, uh, you know, I would I would sort of back up what Tim is saying that that just because they've watched uh, an animation uh, doesn't mean that they've internalized the concept and and that you know sketching and and choosing from a list of most common answers, uh, I think, helps reveal that. I mean, I, I think, you know, the direction that we're looking to head next is, well, let's try several of these different sort of teaching styles uh, using uh, different sort of visualizations or uh, conceptual ways to try and describe uh, these uh, principles uh, and see which which provide better, um, uh, be better student understanding. This is Tim again. Um, one thing I want to highlight about something that Mike said, 
and uh, and I don't get to see your faces, so I didn't get to see anybody s scowling or or gasping. Um, but what Mike said is that one of the things we do with one of the things we're advocating is we're talking with students about incorrect answers, and what one might. Um, what one might think, um, gee, isn't that a bad idea to have the instructor talk in class about uh, an incorrect answer? The student may remember nothing but the incorrect answer. Um, and uh, this is coming from well-established work uh, in mathematics education, that when there is a particularly likely incorrect answer, you're actually, as the instructor, you are better off addressing it than pretending it doesn't exist and trying to teach just the correct uh, answer. To, uh, to, to, to bring it to the forefront in the classroom and talk with students about why a compelling incorrect answer is in fact incorrect, uh, it, it tends to be helpful. I'll just add to that. Um, when I was teaching about hotspot motion, I was talking at the front of the room and I asked them to gesture and I modeled what that gesture should look like. Okay, so this, you know, here's the piece of paper and here's the pencil and this is what it would look like. And they did an activity and we talked about, you know, we watched the video and there was still a lot of disagreement on whether the spot should be north or south of the, the most recent hotspot or most recent caldera so I, I actually they're very reluctant to do the modeling themselves and do the gesturing themselves so once i actually had the students gesture themselves that's when they had that moment where they were they their thinking was transformed so until they were able to externalize the process for themselves uh they couldn't that, that uh the external support wasn't very helpful until they were actually able to model it themselves. Interesting. Um, well, that's the end of our questions, but we did have two hard topics that you guys are more than welcome to comment on if you feel like that. Um, one is from Shelly J, who said that visualizing topography and then relating that to a two-dimensional map or image such as Google Earth is a hard topic for students to understand. And then the other one is from Laurie Duncan, where it's visualizing geometry of seafloor spreading and development of magnetic anomaly stripes on the seafloor. So those were the two hard topics that came through. Um, um, this is Tim. I'll, st uh, I'll start with the uh, topography, uh, and I will uh, re relate that I I, we just had a meeting yesterday about exactly this problem. I've, uh, I've uh, several times come to uh, the problem of working on um, uh, trying to improve students' understanding of topo maps. Uh, I would say, I was about to say bang my head against that problem, and that really was what it was. I um, had a graduate student work for several years on it and got only very modest learning. Uh, what the approach we're taking now is is to use this idea of um, providing feedback uh, in the context of um, working with um, 3D models uh, to see if um, to see if sequences of questions going back and forth between models uh, models of a um, of a area of topographic 3D models uh, of an uh, of an area. Uh, uh, paired with the topo map will help students begin to uh, learn to be able to uh, reason about three, the three D structure that is present in uh, topo maps. Okay, great. Is there any last words from any of our three speakers before we uh, complete this webinar? I'll, I'll just make a comment on the other hard topic. Uh, I think um, the the part I would just, I mean, I don't have a, <laughs> a quick uh, sort of response in terms of uh, a way to attack it, but I, I would I would accentuate the importance of a concept like that because of, you know, how important it is for folks to recognize that the that things sort of go both directions, right? So it's, it, we often try and describe Seafloor spreading now, at, you know, showing students that that you know animations that show you know the 
the black and white stripes, you know, sort of getting pushed away uh, from from the mid ocean ridge. Uh, but I think, you know, that the process of going the other direction, right? I think it's really critical to try and get students to understand going the other direction because that is really, in essence, the the heart of a key discovery in the development of plate tectonics is is seeing those mirror patterns on the seafloor and then connecting them to a to a conveyor belt like motion process. I think you know that that to me I think highlights you know uh, you know one of those you know kinds of conceptual understandings that is not easy for people to have in general, right? If it took until the 60s for for folks to to you know sort of even think about the seafloor that way. I mean I know it's you know in part because of new observations, but but I think you know getting over the hump of understanding how you can go from uh, that mirror pattern to to motion relative to the to the mid ocean ridge. I think you know that's that's a concept we we want to help our students understand and and unpack. You know what are the the obstacles that prevent them from understanding that relationship. That's great. Um, well, with no further questions, um, I just want to thank the three of you, Tim, Mike, and Nicole, um, for your incredible presentations. And um, I'm really happy that they, you know, showed like who they are. And um, I'm sure that they would be free to answer any questions um, if you think of them after the webinar. Um, and yeah, so with that, this concludes our webinar and stay tuned for our next one, which should be coming up soon actually on social media. So stay tuned. All right, thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.